let's get close but not so close for a time. You can share from a distance for a time. You know we want to see each other. You'll have to stay in your quarantine space while we Welcome to uh, episode 53 of Quarantine. And we're in our series now. This is our second to last show before Christmas. And we are looking to the future and uh, thinking about not just a post-COVID economy, but kind of a very hopeful uh, America that is built on more regenerative futures and in particular, real projects that are making this possible. Today is going to be one of our more exciting shows. We have Mayor Bill Peduto from Pittsburgh. We have Mayor Nan Whaley from uh, Dayton and the crew that is putting together the Marshall Plan for the Upper Midwest, a reimagining of the economy, as well as John Cumber from California, who's looking at biomanufacturing out here. Uh, Mickey, what I find exciting about this is, uh, you know, at a time when, when there's been so much political uh, infighting and, and, and so much America doesn't have a sense for what its future, Today, we're getting into a set of conversations that really do define what a next economy is. To me, it's as fundamental as what went on here, uh, you know, during the when America electrified or when we had the programs in the Depression that built the infrastructure that makes America today. Well, I'm excited because, you know, the Marshall Plan is sort of a historic idea that happened, you know, uh, after World War II to really help rebuild economies. And I think this boldness is is exciting. And particularly, you know, I have a few companies uh, that came out of Carnegie Mellon out in the Pittsburgh region, and I, um, I'm a big fan of the region. And also, you know, um, I'm in love with what's been happening with the sort of computational biology, synthetic biology, and the ways that we're looking at uh, sort of instead of brute forcing nature by, you know, drilling up old dead dinosaurs, um, how we're actually looking at ways of kind of co-creating with nature. And so uh, I'm super excited that John uh, is here to to represent that. Uh, and so I just think this will be a fun a fun conversation and frankly, one we need to give us hope and and some action plan for where we're going to go. We should put on the table that these may be the biggest ideas going on in America today and not a moment too soon. Uh, when we hear Mayor Peduto talk about the Marshall Plan for the Midwest, it's inspired by General George C. Marshall, who after World War II created the plan that invested in Europe, rebuilt its manufacturing base, probably kept all of our allies from kind of going socialist and spun the economy back. It created enormous affection around the world for what America could do. And uh, the premise of what we're about to hear from, from Mayor Peduto is that it is time once again to invest in our regions but also to kind of invest in what's possible uh, in America. And uh, and then after that, we're going to go talk to Leslie Marshall and to uh, to Grant Irvin, who are the authors of this plan. How do you do something this big? How do yeah. you gain support for it? And we're going to talk to Nan Whaley, who talks about how this gets interpreted differently in uh, urban Dayton versus, say, in Appalachia. Okay, what an exciting show. Uh, anything you want to do to key up uh, the Mayor Peduto? Yeah, we well, actually, you know, uh, the Mayor Peduto, so, so when I uh, was was running Maya and the spinouts from Maya, like Riza and Luma and things, um, y you know, I really got to see that I, even though I grew up in Chicago, I, I fell in love with the mountains and the rivers and the feeling of, you know, kind of uh, roll up your sleeves and just do stuff that I found in in that region, you know, in, in, that, in that area of, of Pittsburgh and, I'm, you know, minutes away from West Virginia, my place there, and also Ohio and Lordstown and things like that. It's right, right out my door. I can drive over there. And so this notion that there's this region that actually helped build America, that helped supply the steel for, you know, the Brooklyn Bridge and a lot of other things, and and uh, helped us get out of the planet, uh, you know, with Wright Patterson Air Force Base, the Wright brothers and and sister and father and the interesting things that were happening in a bicycle shop in 
in Dayton, Ohio. But that whole region has been very exciting for me, and I raised my kid there. And I and I just think it's um, it's this opportunity to say, what's the transition? And so when I first met Bill, it was probably at a, a, a CMU uh, a Christmas party uh, at at, uh, at my partner Dutch's place. And uh, and I just saw Bill as a councilman. He was just a, a person from that neighborhood who cared about that neighborhood. And he was trying to bring back a really blighted neighborhood. Uh, and um, and then he said, I saw him a few years ago and he said, you know, I still get letters from children uh, in Paris and in France who say, thank you for standing up for the Paris Accords when, you're, when your country said you wouldn't do it. Like the idea w- was just fascinating. He was when Trump said, you know, uh, we're going to focus on Pittsburgh, not Paris. Mayor Peduto, uh, welcome Mayor- to Corn. Yeah, let's 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 watch the uh, the interview because I just that that gives you a little context. Sorry about that. Okay, let's I, I clicked that way, but let's go on to let's hear from Mayor Peduto. Yeah. Uh, Better to hear. Mayor Peduto, welcome to Quarantine. Uh, you and your team have set a vast vision for. Uh, the upper Midwest or middle America for both economic recovery, uh, justice, and a new economy. I guess my first question is, is America ready for this kind of bold thinking? This is, reminds me of what we saw in the 30s and 40s before and after World War II. Um, are we ready for this? Well, I think this is really the time. Uh, you know, part of the reason that we started putting together a Marshall Plan was the 2016 election when we lost Pennsylvania and you look at the results and you understand that Pittsburgh is a blueberry in a bowl of tomato soup. And you start to ask yourself why the people in the county surrounding you voted so overwhelmingly for Donald Trump. And it really became evident that when presented with no hope or false hope, people gravitated to false hope, that the mills would come back, that coal would come back. The reality was we didn't have anything that we could offer. Um, Go forward the next four years and all of a sudden our area has been targeted because of a overproduction of natural gas and they can't sell it. So they start looking uh, the companies from Texas and Oklahoma, Louisiana at the Ohio Valley to become the cracker area uh, for Uh, the cracking of natural gas to create a a product that nobody really is asking for, which is plastic. And their corporate community got behind it as the economic future of our region. But our future's already set sail. It's, It's in technology, it's in medicine, it's in finance. And the opportunity cost of polluting downwind with five cracker plants would be a direct challenge to the industries that are now calling Pittsburgh home. So we said, there has to be a different way. We can't constantly play defense. And that different way became a Marshall Plan, a public-private partnership, not creating a a huge government entity, but finding the companies that are already here, including those that work in the fossil fuel industry, and asking them to expand their portfolios, partnering with the federal government, state government, local government, labor union pension funds in order to put investment into the area that has been left behind and to count on the people and just as importantly the communities they call home to be able to build america again and and this plan that you have is both an economic plan it's a economic justice plan and it's and it's an environmental plan um it and it, it's i guess the, if you get people enrolled in the excitement of it it can work you know so much of of um you know when people heard green new deal they heard a lot of regulations against businesses that they were in um how does one sell this and create the kind of excitement where people are enrolled in their economic future and see the future for them and their kids as opposed to as opposed to thinking that they're told not what to do? Or how do you bridge the red and the blue in all of this? Well, I, I think that it's almost uh, self-evident to the people who live in this part of the country. Um, it is an understanding that we have not seen the type of investment that other parts of the country, especially on either coast, have seen. And we have gone through a destabilizing period of deindustrialization 
which has left us even further behind. Uh, if you start to map out any type of demographic, uh, looking at economic indicators, you'll see that Appalachia all the way from Birmingham, Alabama to Buffalo, New York uh, is behind the rest of the country. And we need to be able to create a narrative for this area that doesn't look at climate change as a conspiracy or a threat, yeah. but looks at it as an economic opportunity for these people. Um, a, lo a lot of the New Green Deal talks about ending mm -hmm. uh, fracking on day one or five year phase out. That would absolutely destroy the communities throughout West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Kentucky and leave people stranded. What this does is it creates a just transition and allows them the opportunity to have a future where their children can follow their career and another generation after that. And I wanted you to relate the story. You know, you told me the last time I saw you uh, in Pittsburgh about when Trump said uh, this should be for Paris, the Paris Accord, not for Pittsburgh. What, what did you say to that? I said, we are going to continue following the Paris Agreement for the economic future of our city and our region. And uh, we have. And here's the thing about it. The, the Marshall Plan actually allows this region to be able to meet the 2030, 2035, and 2050 goals of the Paris Agreement. So it is centered around a green and climate change narrative but it is packaged and delivered as an economic development strategy. Um, how did you get the other mayors involved? How did, like, tell us a little bit about, uh, we're gonna have Nan on the show today from, from Dayton. You know, how did you, how did you communicate and kind of, were they ready for this? How did this kind of creating a, a league of leaders to think about this, how did that come about? It came about through research that the University of Pittsburgh did <clears throat> early in the process of the Katz School of Business School of Sustainability in looking at common indicators of uh, cities and then realizing that the footprint should be really looking at the northern Appalachia and Ohio Valley. Mm -hmm. Conversations with the individual mayors on what's already happening here. What uh, Greg Fisher is doing down in Louisville uh, around rural broadband and around artificial intelligence. Mayor Cranley building out the largest solar farm in the country and doing it two counties away from the, the, uh, Cincinnati uh, in order to be able to produce enough energy to run his entire city government. Uh, the mayor uh, uh, Tito in uh, Youngstown, Ohio, who right down the, the street in Lordstown is working to create electrified public transit so that as the United States transitions into electric buses, we don't have to buy them from China. We can buy them from Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, Huntington, West Virginia, turning old coal mine and coal stripped land into solar fields and training people into solar assembly. I mean, all of these examples are already happening and all these mayors want to tell that story. The question is, how do you amplify it? And then how do you get the investment in the companies that are already here? One example I'll give you from Pittsburgh, Phipps Conservatory, built the greenest building in the world. Uh, the new building on their campus uh, meets the living building challenge. Only a few dozen buildings like this exist on earth. Uh, there are two of them in Pittsburgh and soon we'll have five. But the building on Phipps Conservatory's campus, every single part of it was purchased or engineered or designed within a 100 mile radius. Meaning that the buildings of tomorrow, generations from now, they will produce their own energy. There won't be grids to worry about. We, and we well, should- I love, be, I love this idea of the, the you know, hyper-local. How do you create more circular, um, uh, Norman Foster, the famous architect, calls this infrastructureless infrastructure, where it's more like how nature works, right? Every cell in your body has a spare copy of how to make you. You know, and that's what's wonderful about it. It's like super resilient because it's kept, it's kept kind of local, which means you don't have the energy costs, obviously, of shipping stuff from another part of the world. I've been to the BYD plant in, in um, Shenzhen that makes the electric buses that are being sold into Europe right now. And it didn't exist five years ago. 
you know, they literally added a new, a new section of the city and started doing it because they realized electric cars, the battery degrades and you can bundle it up and put it into a bus and then you can bundle it up and put it into a, a neighborhood and it'll last for 20 years because you actually look at it as a system. So I, I'm, I'm so, and I love the Phipps Conservatory. I, I just wandering there. It's net positive even, right? It's not even net zero. It's creating fresh water. It's creating, you know, energy and stuff. And I hey, think Mayor that's- Peduto, I would love to ask, and it's been out for a few weeks now. Let's talk about how one sells this, lights the imagination and, and, and turns it real. What have you heard from the new administration, from Congress? Uh, how is this thing being sold? And uh, because it's a $60 billion a year plan. So how does that all come together? Yeah, it's it, when the $60 billion is not just a direct check from the federal government to the region. Uh, there would be grants and different types of incentives that we would be looking to Congress. And we had a conversation with the appropriations uh, chair uh, just today uh, of having that conversation with the Biden administration and really concentrating not just on our region, but also the Great Lakes region as well. Uh, there would be a request at the state level for tax abatements uh, and being able to create a tax abatement uh, program for companies that uh, meet the certain criteria of what these industries would be. And then there would be the direct private investment of companies and individuals uh, and looking at union pension funds and city pension funds as additional investment in order to be able to incentivize these companies to locate here or to expand here. What we're really looking at as well, and I said this a little bit earlier, is we're not looking to penalize fossil fuel companies. Yeah. We want to get them to understand that if they want to be here in 50 years, that they need to diversify their portfolios. And we want to provide them the opportunity to do so. Uh, right now, uh, a former uh, Clinton uh, uh, campaign manager and uh, uh, Democratic National Committee Chairman David Wilhelm is back in Ohio and he's working in Columbus and he's building green hydrogen power plants in Asia and in Africa. And he wants to find an area that he can build green hydrogen valley, uh, power plants throughout a valley that could help to fuel an entire region. Why not the Ohio Valley? And you know, you've been through this with Pittsburgh. I'm, part of your message is in 1978, steel kind of evaporated. There wasn't a plan and you've laid out the fact that this time you could lose 100,000 jobs or with this create 400,000. Yeah, that's the net effect. There's a, a half a million jobs at stake here. If we do nothing, we, we know we will lose 100,000 jobs in the fossil fuel industry over the next 10 years, 40,000 of which will come out of West Virginia. They will be decimated. And this on top of what this entire region went through with deindustrialization. You know, there, there's a statement, you never plan to fail, you just fail to plan. And we have this time period in this next 10 years to put together a transition plan that invests back into this area in the industries that will be harmed by the transition that the entire world's going and instead be able to lead in being a producer, manufacturer of the products that the world would be moving toward. There's, there's a story here that could almost get America to believe in itself again, to get the region to believe in itself. I wonder if you have thoughts on how that happens, how it's communicated, how you enroll the public in co-creating this school kids so that there's almost a groundswell of this could be us. If the Biden administration decides to, to make this a priority, I believe that's where the emphasis will come under the more grandiose type of approach toward the marketing of it. Uh, but right now we're, we're doing shoe leather. So uh, we're planning on uh, discussing with a handful of Congress members in January, trying to build out the delegation of, of uh, federal and state elected officials uh, throughout each of the different metro areas, and then being able to partner with local labor, corporate, uh, uh, environmental and university. The one common factor of all eight of our cities is that we all have a strong academic 
institution, whether it's Marshall University in Huntington, West Virginia, or WVU in Morgantown, Youngstown State, Dayton, Cincinnati, Ohio State, Louisville, Pitt, Carnegie Mellon. We all have that academic institution that is a critical partner in this. Mayor Peduto, thank you so much. Th 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 this is completely inspiring. Uh, we may be getting a little ahead of ourselves in thinking of the national implications of this, but you know, I've used what you're doing in talking with our economic development people here in California and our city, and you're inspiring us to think this big. And, and, uh, and I think this, as different regions start thinking big, that's just a, a great moment of recreation for our country. We've had good conversations with Canada uh, and uh, Al Alberta in particular, in looking at a similar model wow. and conversations with Scotland and Glasgow and their region. Uh, I think that this is an interesting idea for post-industrial regions of the world to reinvent themselves. The difference between this and some other plans is that we have been working very hard to bring the Sierra Club and the Steelworkers together. Good jobs, green jobs. The uh, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette endorsed Donald Trump for president and then three weeks later endorsed the Marshall Plan. It has the ability to cross into different areas where we have been divided on climate and to put it into an economic development package where people can agree. Well, that was amazing. Yeah, no, I, I love Bill. Um, and and I actually, I'm just excited by all the leaders that are here today and, and some of those examples. Um, I, I liked your comment. Could the region believe in themselves again? I actually think the region believes in itself. I think the problem is that it 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 isn't always. I don't think it gets to play on the same the same playing field sometimes as where maybe, you know, different stories get told. I, I think it it has more to do with just light a path. Uh, yeah. Bill said at the end this transition, design. You know, a few uh, weeks ago we had Terry Irvin Irwin, who leads a brand new institute at Carnegie Mellon called Transition Design. It looks at social technical economic shifts that whole regions and cities can do over the course of a decade or two, because you have to have long-term system planning. And I think that's where, where Bill's going. And I'm super excited about our next guest. I'd love to, I'd love to uh, uh, have Nan come on. Nan, uh, turn off your mute so that we can hear you. And- um, Hi. Thank you, thanks for coming. Tell us, that was Bill. You, you and Bill know each other well. Mm -hmm. uh, what's going on in Dayton? What do you tell tell us about your perspective on the Marshall Plan for Middle America? Well, I, I think Bill, you know, it really has put together this great vision for what um, the middle of the country could really offer when it when it comes to energy jobs, energy opportunity. And I think from that um, interview you guys just had with him, the the part that is, I think most uh, important for places like Dayton is that if we're not intentional about these new energy jobs, which are coming, they're going to be landing somewhere. If they don't land in the middle of the country where we've seen significant loss from manufacturing fossil fuel or uh, steel, that this um, disheartenedness that's going on in our democracy will continue to be exasperated. So hmm. Uh, I think that's really important. We know this uh, economy is coming. We know this is the future. Uh, we just need the government, I think, to be intentional about where these jobs land. You know, Nan, um, when we were talking the other day, you were just telling us about the particular things you care about in this plan for Dayton and for, you know, because every region is different and every region has different uh, raw materials to work with in terms of human capital and in terms of regional capital. What, what's going on particularly to Dayton that you really, you keep you up at night or that you get excited about how can we, how can we change? How can we make a difference? Yeah, so I mean, Dayton's backbone is, is very similar to the cities that are in this group. You know, we are gritty and we are resilient and we are hard workers. And so uh, I think this is a place that has a very strong work ethic. It's very diverse, uh, uh, but you know, it has this fundamental core belief that if you work hard and play by the rules, you should be able to take care, care of your family and you're the next generation should be able to do better. Uh, than the previous generation. And what is troubling is because the wage has become so depressed, 
uh, in this region. Mm -hmm. That's just not the case. You know, uh, uh, homes, rental homes are about $750 a month. I know in California, that sounds amazing, That's but crazy. when, yeah. when the wage, when the wage is so low that that is 50 to 60% of your income, that's, wow. it doesn't matter. And, and that yeah. I think is the challenge for us in, in the Dayton area. We have way too many people that are working, uh, too many jobs, uh, and still landing in the food line. You know, I mean, yeah. this whole idea of, Job creation is kind of funny. I mean, the joke here is, yeah, like I know there's a lot of jobs. I have four of them. So uh, <laughs> that's really the attitude and uh, the trouble that's going on right now. Hmm. I think not only in Dayton, but cities like Dayton across the country. Are, so are you, you, uh, oh, go ahead, Peter. I was going to ask, um, when we were talking the other day, you were pointing out that part of, part of what has to be done here is a person in inner city Dayton can't probably imagine that they might have a tech or a, you know, a green job. And similarly, probably somebody in Appalachia who grew up either in, in, in fossil fuel or manufacturing can't imagine that this future could be theirs. And I'm wondering what you can tell us about using this as a way, and this is kind of what I meant earlier when I was talking about <clears throat> getting people to believe in themselves or believe that mm -hmm. this transition could be real. Well, I think, I think what we do here is we make things, right? That's what we've been known to do. We continue. It's still you know, an outsize, I think across the country, manufacturing is around 11% of GDP. It's 18% in this region. Uh, that is what we do. Energy, frankly, is making something. And, you know, these new energy jobs have huge opportunities, whether it's, you know, creating solar panels or, you know, making wind turbines or, you know, the function of uh, this this work is, is a manufacturing job. And so I think, that's I think that's what that's how we view it. And I think that's how folks would view it here. Uh, it would also then mean that they'd be more open to the work of uh, what's coming. Right. It wouldn't be um, this cultural identity that's around fossil fuels. The fact of the matter is in Kentucky and Ohio, there really aren't that many fossil fuel jobs, but it is remembered and it is the last good paying job anybody had. And mm. so that identity is not something to be trifled with. And frankly, it provided uh, generations of wealth for people in these communities. What is needed is a new industry that that con that contributes wealth again to these families. And that is what has been missing. I mean, ever since the decision of NAFTA in these in these communities, we have seen um, take less and sorry, it's just not going to work out for your community. And that's not a, 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 a thoughtful way to do development in the country. And uh, you can see how people would get pretty angry pretty quickly. Well, it seems to me too, there's this, there's this. there been this compression in the last 30 or 40 years of um, what it means to be a corporation, what it means to be an organization and the sort of financialization of corporations. And I've, I've seen this firsthand means that uh, the time frame of looking out for your stakeholders, not just your shareholders, has collapsed to uh, what, what am I doing this quarter? And that meant that I would look at a spreadsheet and go, oh, I can I can just move some jobs from here to here. And I, I save a lot of money because they don't have maybe human rights or maybe they don't have the rule of law. So right. I can kind of do things, um, you know, and, and I think now actually the rest of the world has come up and I don't think that's a bad thing. But I think what's happening is people are starting to realize that that, you know, converting ideas into atoms, which is what manufacturing is, you know, with energy, joules of energy, you know, is a non-trivial thing. It's not the same as making a shopping cart or a cool, you know, web storefront. And and we've had a brain drain of people, frankly, to the to the coast, the Boston and, and uh, Silicon Valley area. And basically, people are, are like spending their lives building things that suck people's eyeballs out, I guess, on Facebook, and then just make a better shopping cart. Is that what you wanted to do? And, right. and I'm actually talking to people in the, the Valley. And they're like, actually, I love it when we make things. I want to make things. You know, right. and, and obviously Duolingo has, has done a nice job in California putting posted uh, big posters up and billboards on the highway saying, would you like to work in tech? Would you like to have an actual house and a beautiful region come to pittsburgh right and duolingo is is wildly successful because of that um and and they're actually hiring like crazy and so there are the great smart people who know how to make things who know how to get stuff done how do we help them transition 
And I, I wonder, one of the things you mentioned was just uh, the social justice side of things. So can you say a little more about kind of even in Dayton, what, what some of the challenges are there in terms of social justice? Obviously this year we've seen Black Lives Matter movement. We've seen, you know, hidden epidemics that are being exposed uh, by, by what's going on. What's happening in Dayton? How, will, how might this help? Well, I think too, if you look at, you know, we're on the I-75 corridor, so it's Detroit on down. And so it is the, it is the corridor that built the automobile and frankly builds, builds the airplane today. Uh, aerospace and automobile are the manufacturers of the 75 corridor. And mm. what, you, what you see there is um, the building of the black middle class as well. And mm. so when people talk a lot about this issue, I think uh, particularly when we're talking about Appalachia or we're talking about the upper Midwest, th they just automatically assume that it only has to do with white workers. And really, that's not the case. I mean, you know, most of these plants were pretty evenly split between black and white workers. And the the real hard part of the reframing of our of our economy over the past 30 years has affected black workers, I would argue, probably more uh, than white workers. And that has exasperated these issues around uh, race and economy. And uh, my point and why I'm so excited about Bill's uh, vision and why we support it is we know that this is a growth industry. We know we can make this stuff. We know we need to have a part in it uh, and, and we must uh, have it placed here or you're going to see more exasperation um, around racial strife, around uh, um, uh, white working uh, families uh, blaming someone else uh, because of the anger that their community is not as better off as it was 10 years ago, and it must be somebody else's fault. It certainly is somebody else's fault. I don't disagree that <laughs> nothing wrong. I just think they put the blame in the wrong place. There's also yeah. a very interesting component of this in which it's not just onshoring or against importing, but it's a circular economy. It's made in Youngstown. It's used in your city. You make something and it's used in Pittsburgh, right? There's a regional economic concept here that is that is that is very powerful and uh, and very positive, as opposed to being a kind of a nationalistic thing. Well, I think I think people, Peter, under, misunderstand the supply chain, right? So yeah. you know, you know, one of the things that happened when Barack Obama saved the automobile industry, uh, the 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 people of Dayton, even though you know our plant closed, right, the General Motors truck and bus plant closed, the suppliers were still supplying because that supply mm. chain is connected to Detroit. It is that three hour drive. And so my point about these energy jobs, they just can't, well, you know, it's, it is going to be a supply chain. Yeah. And the choice of where that supply chain ends up sitting is really, really important. And that it needs to be in the Middle West, I, I believe, because if not, uh, number one, there is opportunity, there is the workforce, there is the infrastructure, uh, it, and there's the opportunity to change hearts and minds. So all of that together will strengthen uh, America's economy and America's ethos uh, around climate, around this idea of green jobs, because they will benefit from it. The last time when Obama did this, uh, you know, you know, I put solar panels on my roof over this with the, the energy tax credits. You know, the only place that really benefited in Ohio from green jobs was Toledo uh, with some some wind jobs. It has to be deeper than that, and it has mm. to be more thoughtful, and we just can't let the market do what the market does. And that's that's really the message that I have, because you're right, Mickey, the market is going to look at like quarterly returns. They're mm. not going to think long term. And if we don't get involved and start thinking long term about what's best for this country, we will be um, uh, upset in a few years saying, why is everybody so mad? And why are these folks having to pay so much to do something? And these people don't have to pay anything, but they don't have any money. That's the challenge of America right now. Uh, and this uh, Marshall Plan for Middle America uh, really lays out that opportunity. Let me say, too, you know, when we talked about George Marshall and we talk about the history of America, you know, it is it is incumbent on the government to make the market do things. Because if it doesn't, you you get 
complete communities without electricity now without broadband you get mm. communities that don't have the same access and right now i think for the past 40 years this country has decided to let the market decide and it is and it has picked winners and losers in a really really unfair way and as a country and as leaders we have to say enough and i think you know there is way there are ways to regulate the market there are ways to be good capitalists i'm not you know i'm a capitalist i believe in that but unfettered right you know markets will will bring incredible inequity and we're saying that you know i think what I, one of the things i uh, just finished reading a book called the ministry of the future and um, it's sort of science fiction, but it starts at 2020 and it's based on the Paris Accord and it plays out the actual climate science coming from Jet Propulsion Lab and NASA from their satellites that are looking down on the earth and their sensors out in the ocean from NOAA. And it basically points out that uh, the capitalists or the people who can buy an island and hide away from the world, there isn't going to be a planet to actually do that with. I mean, unless you know how to create food from nothing because because the earth will will pass on and apparently there's only one forest we've been able to find in this galaxy so we might want to like protect the earth and then i think there's this opportunity to really add that trillions of dollars will be made um to actually repair some of the damage that's happened since probably uh the mesopotamian valley when we started taking carbon out of out of the soil so so there's a lot to do yeah peter i know you'd like to get I'd love the architects of the plan. Is that what we'd like to do next? Well, yeah. I w why don't we bring on, uh, because we're talking about something fundamental here, let's bring on the co-authors of this. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Leslie Marshall from the uh, University of Pittsburgh and Grant Irvin, who is the chief sustainability officer uh, in Pittsburgh. And and guys, this is, you're, you're authoring how to get to a fundamental economic transition as big as when we went from agriculture to industry, we've gone into this kind of more extractive age. Um, how do you guys go about coming up with something that is this fundamental and kind of what's the TikTok of how you go from a great idea to, and, and now we hope it will happen? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in first. Uh, you know, the germination of the idea, I think, really starts with uh, the experience that we've had in Pittsburgh. And you've heard a little bit about uh, Mickey and Mara Peduta kind of talk uh, about that experience, which is, uh, you know, if you go back to 1982, 1983, Pittsburgh, uh, we suffered more unemployment than the city of Detroit did during the 2007, 2008 mm -hmm. recession. And there was no Barack Obama back then. There was a Ronald Reagan and there was no federal package uh, to help, you know, like what Mayor Whaley talked about in terms of kind of resurrecting uh, the automobile industry, that same type of lifeline life was not extended to the steel industry. Hmm. And as a result, we went through a, a soul searching, if you will, uh, for the greater part of 20, 25 years before uh, kind of the next iteration started to take shape. Um, and Mayor Peduto, you know, kind of lived through that as, as did I as a, as a young kid. Um, seeing our family, seeing our friends, you know, leave the region um, because there was no longer, uh, you know, family sustaining jobs. Um, and I always, you know, tell the story you'll hear on Monday night football or Sunday night football about how great Steeler fans travel, uh, which is true. Um, but the other portion of it is that there's Pittsburgh, Pittsburghers that are spread all across the country because of that diaspora. Hmm. And you know, in that junction of time. Wait, is that why you can find a sealer bar kind of everywhere? <laughs> oh, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. It was it was really kind of intentional in that way, right? Is that is that the trick? Yeah. But football will not save us, though. I mean, all by football itself. Football will not save us. You exactly. don't want to get any any hate mail. But uh, but you know, the idea that we needed a bold uh, a bold idea um, was kind of born at that in that junction, right? That in the point of time that we're at as a as a country and as a collection of cities, we needed to find a way to galvanize together and take advantage of the moment where we're seeing, uh, you know, the continual decline of our local economies, but also these twin challenges of economic injustice and climate change, which is a global phenomenon. And it's rooted very deeply in the Ohio River Valley and in Upper Appalachia. 
So, uh, you know, coming together as cities and, you know, through the leadership of our, our mayors like, like Mayor Whaley and Mayor Peduto, um, we banded together with our university partners and community partners to help shape this vision um, and to effectively start to lay a runway for what the future could look like. Hmm. And I'll just add to that a little bit, you know, from, from our perspective, we've had the conversations about what would ultimately become the roadmap about a year ago this time, I think, Grant, we were first starting to talk about this. And so the Center for Sustainable Business that, that um, I'm the associate director of, we work directly with large companies who are looking to transition to more sustainable business models. So we have this really um, strong relationship with our corporate partners who are all looking for ways to participate in this future forward economy. We have our, had a tremendous partnership with the city of Pittsburgh since our center kicked off, including with Grant, especially, and with Mayor Peduto. And so this idea of being able to work with policymakers to be that bridge as a university to companies who are looking to do um, innovative things in the space, who are looking to be part of that transition. Um, and then bringing that together with uh, some of our partners at um, uh, the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, led by Jeffrey Sachs at Columbia University. I have some great connections to economists there who do exactly these kind of plans at the state level. So um, Professor Pollan, uh, Bob Pollan, who did the analysis for that part of our report as well. So really, um, this collaborative idea, which is at the core of the MP for MA concept across sectors, is how we were able to pull this off in the first place. And the whole point of the roadmap was to, to put together a vision. At the time that we started this, it was a bunch of pieces and the idea was how could we put all these pieces together into a single picture and give people something to point to, to start conversations with, to go from there to actually building out more projects, realizing more collaborations across sectors. What, um, Leslie, I'm curious about your reaction to what Bill and Nance had just said, you know, in terms of, um, you know, how do you see the roadmap? How, how do you see like Dayton fitting into it? Or how do you see, you know, as a region, but also the larger kind of issues that Nan brought up about some of the social injustice, some of the some of the challenges that that uh, you know that we've heard that, and we know if we know if we have family in that region, that they kind of uh, if they don't have another idea, then they think the other must have caused the problem, and and the other usually is whoever looks a little differently than me, not maybe the that weird corporate fuzzy board that's sitting in some other part of the planet. What what's your reaction to what Nan is talking about or Bill is talking about and and how do you see like first steps or early steps that could actually help people see that it's possible or or some you know a roadmap usually has the first baby steps out of the door you know you, where's that going what what is what's your sense of that or you know where could we go so I think there are a number of different directions and I think a number of different actors are going to be engaged in different things simultaneously, right? We're all going to be sort of working together at the same time to move things forward. But I want to speak to a few things that you said, and then I, I think I'd like to invite a Grant and perhaps Mayor Whaley as well to, to chime in here, because I think a big part of what Mayor Peduto and Mayor Whaley are talking about is related to the fact that the messenger matters. This report this roadmap is coming from the region. It's created by people who are deeply embedded in these communities or who have connections. And as this roadmap is just a starting point for these conversations, this isn't here's the exact thing that we have to do being handed down for all of us to follow. It's a place that we can meet and begin to really push these conversations, these projects forward from here. So I think the most immediate steps is exactly what we're doing right now, which is to talk about um, some of the awareness raising around these projects. So the reality is what Mayor Peduto was saying, what Mayor Whaley is saying, these projects already exist in our communities. The largest solar array in the country is in Southern Ohio, right? The, um, uh, an, elect an entirely electric vehicle manufacturing center is coming out of Lordstown outside of Youngstown, Ohio. These are not projects that only exist. They're not coming just from New York or from California. And the report you know, benefits, we, we, we know we can learn a lot from folks all around the world, including from European partners, including from uh, mm -hmm. folks in other parts of the United States. But we wanna make it clear to folks that this is already happening organically in our own communities, simply because it has to, because we need these outlets, because we're seeing these sort of traditional and legacy industries declining. We mm -hmm. need to create these opportunities for ourselves. Why can't we have a roadmap where we're really talking about collaborating to scale up those impacts so that we're not talking about creating 10, 50 jobs, we're talking about creating thousands of jobs in an industry and being able to actually, um, so we talk when, about a just transition, we talk about phasing people 
from fossil fuel industry jobs into these new economy jobs. And in some cases, it's a pretty easy match. Theoretically, the skill sets transferred. In other cases, there is needs for, there are needs for workforce development or retraining. That is not an easy conversation to have. And you're certainly not gonna go to someone who's been doing a particular job really well uh, for decades and tell them, okay, tomorrow now you're gonna all of a sudden go code in a lab, here you are, right? That's, that's not gonna work. We need to, um, in fact, Grant actually can, can speak to that quite a bit. I've, I've heard him talk about this, this example in our communities as well. So I think the messenger matters to demonstrate for people these projects do exist. Um, and then I think one piece that was critical as we're developing the report is the equity lens has to be part of this. We have to acknowledge and recognize that some of the persistent inequalities that exist across our communities along racial lines are due to um, policies that have created and widened gaps um, that continue to exist to today. So as we build out these industries, we need to be really intentional. I love that Mayor Whaley used this word because we need to be intentional about the jobs coming here, but we also need to be intentional about the quality of those jobs and the requirements that are put on. Mm. So labor unions play a key role here, not only in terms of labor protections and quality jobs with benefits, but also when we work with labor unions about pipeline programs, how are we gonna require that more women, more people of color are part of those labor unions that are getting those jobs? Um, and so I think this is a, a big piece of it. And then of course, I, I'll stop here, but we could go on and on about the fact that um, as, we, uh, build, uh, as we transition to a, a more renewables-based economy, reducing air pollution, which disproportionately affects communities of color and so on, that is definitely true uh, across our communities, but... Um, with Man, that. you looked like you wanted to say something. <laughs> I, just, I was going to just say that Leslie has it like dead on. That's exactly right. Everything she said is like so, so dead on. So I appreciated that and really appreciated that succinctness on what, what is needed. Thanks. You know, one, one thing I'd add to just kind of build on, and this is, is a, a bit of uh, coming from Mayor, Mayor Whaley's remarks too, is that there's also this issue of regional equity. And, you know, so we, we focus in on the individual a lot, but our region specifically has been out of balance from an equity standpoint versus those on the coast. So mm -hmm. if you look at where capital is generating and flowing to, whether it's venture capital mm -hmm. or private equity dollars that are investing in these companies, it's not coming to our region. Um, yet we are the ones that would benefit the most from that capital as well as have kind of the manufacturing capabilities. So that, that idea of intentionality and having a regional equity um, that brings the financial equity to the equation is really critical. Mm -hmm. That, you know, a couple of things that we're, we're working on right now, you know, as, as we speak uh, are, are some issues about kind of activating this. And what we've seen since the release of the report is the opportunity to build a tent. Um, you know, we've had, you know, every week since the release of the report right after the election, We've had three or five organizations or communities that come to us to say, we want to be a part of this. Like we want to get on the train and we want to be able to help. So the idea that we can organize for action is really critical. The second is, you know, working with our labor partners and, and, and Mickey and Peter, you'd, you'd be interested in this. We were talking about finances a little bit earlier. The type of capital really matters. Um, and as Mayor Peduto talked about, this is not just a federal investment equation. Well, that's a critical component. What we're seeing is the idea of repatriating pension capital to these uh -huh. communities is really important. One, because they have the money that they want to invest, but instead of investing in say like the, the Singapore infrastructure fund, which is really mm -hmm. great for the people of Singapore, what if we invest it in the infrastructure in our own backyards? And mm -hmm. so that capital and connecting that capital with projects in our own cities and communities is another key thing that we're working on with the Heartland Investors Network, some of our labor uh, and pension fund partners. Mm. We're working with people like David Wilhelm and others to say, hey, not only do we have projects that are part of our climate action plans, our sustainability plans, and you guys have the capital, how do we start to marry that together? Mm. And then the third piece, just real quick, the third piece is about policy development. Um, mm. You know, working directly with kind of our congressional leaders, which is, you know, they, they heard their mayors, right? And they're like, hey, we we have some ideas, too. In fact, you know, we were just talk, talking with Representative Kaptur to, uh, today um, from up around the Toledo area where she's like, we need these big ideas in D.C. Um, you know, and Bill and Nan, like we, we want you guys to share them with us and, and help us build that message. Well, um, I do think I mean, for for people that are tuning in from other parts of the world or from from other parts of the country. 
you know, one of the robotics companies, you know, in 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 the region is going to be landing on the moon. Astrobotics. Astrobotics. Uh, code written for the Mars lander that's in, on Mars, mostly written in this region. And I, and I think uh, I just this morning talked to a group at uh, Ohio State University where, <coughs> where Dr. Lal, Ratan Lal there, won the Nobel effectively for uh, agricultural and crop science for renewable and regenerative mm -hmm. um, sort of permaculture stuff. He started out as, as a subsistence farmer uh, working with his dad in India. He came to America with $60. He thought he had won the lottery, $60 in India at the time. When he got here, he realized he couldn't even get a student housing for, to go to college for like a month. He now just won. People are making pilgrimages from around the world to Ohio State University for Ritan Lal because he just won this year, you know, effectively the Nobel Prize for, for green farming and green growth. And and we we sort of know this stuff, but they're all disconnected. And I actually hey, I'm wondering if you're thinking that this is an auspicious moment, almost a secular change of ca tech capital moving from the coast to the rest of the country. If the pandemic has shown us anything, our tech companies have realized we could do this anywhere. In the last few weeks, we've seen the headquarters of, of Oracle uh, and a couple of other companies, a, a, a Tesla, leave town. So in California, we're keenly aware of the fact that tech can be done in many places. And our role increasingly is to kind of create be part of creating technologies and networks that can happen anywhere. Are you seeing this as a kind of a very cool moment for this kind of stuff to happen? I, I think it's part of it. You know, it, the big connection that we have to make is aligning the right type of capital for the right type of investment. You know, so when we're talking about federal dollars, the federal government is, is you know, a really good source of catalytic money, you know, kind of grant money, block yeah. grants, also as a guarantor. Um, and so those are the types of programs. Yeah, the third piece there, I think, is the alignment of agencies and creating interagency cooperation between, say, EPA, DOT, HUD, um, and energy, and bringing them together to help us jointly solve problems is really important. But that that tech capital, that that has a, you know, three to five, I mean, Mickey yeah. knows better than us, but like, you know, one to three, three to five year time horizons in terms of what that burn rate is expected. It's not patient. It's not it's patient. Not patient. Wow. Versus, versus when you look at you know, say private equity or pension capital that has much longer time horizons and patients yeah. that are more tuned to the needs of projects that we have here in well, city. I think too, though, that uh, Peter, I think I think there's a danger in thinking it's a zero sum game. Like if the if it moves from you know Cisco moving or whoever it was moving to Austin, whatever that means, San Francisco or the the Bay Area, you know, drops down. And actually, this isn't a zero sum game right now. It's like all boats can rise because we have to. We have to like, there's mm -hmm. plenty of jobs to do or there's no boat and no ocean to deal with. So it's not, I mean, it's kind of an either or thing and I hate to be the Cassandra here, but it's a significant challenge that we have to understand. I'd love to get John in here because I, I want a little taste of science fiction to some extent. And I'd also love him to kind of reflect on what he heard um, because John has been trying to help people see what the potential is. John, thank you so much for coming. You're, yeah, I'm such a big fan. Uh, what's your reaction is sort of what you've heard so far and tell us a little bit about what you're seeing and what you're doing. Sure, yeah, good to see everybody and good to hear this conversation. I run a network of innovation called SynBioBeta and SynBioBeta is all about the synthetic biology industry. And the synthetic biology industry is all about reading, writing and editing of DNA and designing and building biological circuits and systems that are going to produce everything from biomanufactured materials to living medicines and drugs to novel kinds of foods to even consumer products. I was just sent a Christmas gift, just uh, it now wrapped up for my kids to be surprised by under the tree, but it's a living nightlight. It's, uh, it's like a, a glass ornament that stands on your desk, and it's actually got the dinoflagellates inside of it, which are these bioluminescent organisms. And uh, I've had one before a couple of years ago, so I know exactly um, what my kids are, are in for. Uh, but these kinds of living consumer products and, and living things and biomanufactured things are what I see as the future. And I am very interested to hear about the 
the, the big sucking sound that we're hearing from tech in different directions, whether it's headquarters or, or financial um, incentives or employees. I think what's great about biology as a technology for the future is it's a sticky technology for manufacturing. It is the means of production. And uh, I got into interested in public policy about uh, 18 months ago. I wrote a piece for Forbes called The Bio Belt. How can we reinvigorate rural America with biomanufacturing? And I see it as a key technology that um, I, I tell people, if you want to get a job, then study computer science. If you want a career, then study biology because there's just a blue ocean out there what we can do with biology. And well, and I think it's important to note when you say biomanufacturing, you know, people might think it's down at some cellular level because we've all been getting a, a global epidemiology class from COVID. But, but you mean like, you know, encouraging funguses to grow the constituent parts of concrete and build buildings, grow them. You mean like changing out the stuff inside of fabric for insulation with something that was that was grown. You mean meat protein from the air itself, which was one of your innovators this year. And these are real things. These aren't like fake or magic or science fiction. Nature has been using solar power in the form of algae to manufacture stuff for a pretty long time. So so of all these these trees that we see. Um, and, and so nature is an R&D lab that's three billion years old on this planet. And it, it, it puts us all to shame with manufacturing like everything, including us. So so it's this notion of kind of co-creating with nature instead of brute forcing it, you know, and digging up a bunch of dead dinosaurs. What What's a real tangible example in your in your even agenda for a bio belt? What's a real good, like tangible example of the, the kinds of jobs you would see coming first or the kinds of investments people might want to make today to, to start being a part of that? If I'm young or if I'm actually uh, later in life, and I'm trying to figure out where I should invest my time. Sure. I think that we're seeing bioengineering, genetic engineering, synthetic biology mature into its own engineering discipline. And we're starting to see abstraction layers appear in that, um, in that industry. So just like um, maybe at the beginning of civil engineering or structural engineering, uh, if you look at old bridges and how they were kind of pieced together with stones and uh, and and uh, of, of different shapes and sizes, and then they then they figured out, oh, if we standardize the stones that we make and we turn them into bricks, then we can start to build more structurally sound bridges. Well, the same is happening with with biology. That at the moment, pretty much a biologist one size fits all, and um, everybody is uh, you can do everything. But you're starting to see now segmentation of different people mm -hmm. within the industry. So you can get people who specialize just on the design of the DNA. You get people who specialize just on the design of the proteins. You get people who can specialize just on the pilot scale facilities of these fermenters, and then people who could specialize on the scale up and fermentation facilities at mass scale. And so I think we can see many different products at these scales as well. One of my favorite products is the Impossible Burger. Uh, the reason that it is impossible, the reason that it, it tastes like meat is because it has this engineered heme protein inside of it. Actually, it's a natural heme protein from, from beetroot. And they express it in yeast, meaning they, they take the, the genes from the beetroot, they put it into, into yeast, and they brew it just like you would brew beer or wine. And you can now so scale. If you've got an artisanal brewing company. Um, you know, yeast has been used for centuries to manufacture stuff. If you, you know, there, there are all these things where probably a lot of the skills you learned were kind of important it's just that there are different levels of this because also there's there's just so many so many things happening here. What what surprised you about products that have already started to come out, uh, or or things that are now being validated in the lab, but still a little ways away? That that when you host your yearly conference or your big conferences, you go, wow, okay, something's happening. Yeah, last year I had an annual conference in San Francisco. I skated out onto the stage with a skateboard that was made from an engineered polymer inspired by spider silk. I was wearing a, a jacket, a, a North Face jacket. Um, this was the company uh, Spiber in Japan that was also brewed from this protein that was like spider silk. And, um, and we were eating samples of, uh, of cell-based uh, sushi that were, that were made from fish. Mm. Uh, fish cells that have been grown in the lab. Um, so this kind of motherless meat uh, that, that's uh, that's the meme that's out there. 
So I'm I'm constantly surprised by the innovation. We there's there's a battle though for to, to get into the marketplace and a battle to scale the economics because of the entrenched industries uh, like the petrochemicals industry. So uh, I, I'm excited by the products that are coming into the future. I'm very supportive of everything I've heard about uh, the climate initiatives that we've been talking about and, and what Pittsburgh is doing. Um, but uh, but yeah, there's still a lot of entrenched uh, trillions of dollars of entrenched infrastructure that we're that we're all, all, all of. Uh, John, what I find fascinating about this is you're coming at it from new forms of manufacturing and biology, but fundamentally it's a change from an extractive to a regenerative culture or economics. And the team Midwest is coming at energy from that same proposition. If you connect right. them together, here's this master idea that says. We built the 20th century out of extracting stuff from the earth. And you can even argue the tech industry has been extractive in terms of strip mining our, our mines or how Facebook works. And there's kind of a realization egged on by this pandemic that it's time to switch to something else. And we're seeing all these examples, not the least of which was the miracle of, of uh, synthetic biology technology making three or four vaccines show up in less than a year if we wanted some more proof points. So and you've just created an economic development plan for Mayor Newsom to start actually looking at big ideas like this for manufacturing here. Yeah, we put together a plan for the governor of California back at the beginning of the COVID outbreak on how we could re-envision the California bioeconomy. And we called it uh, Built with Biology. And um, and I was also the, the chair of uh, the Biden Science Policy Committee for the bioeconomy. So a lot of these ideas are now being uh, passed on to the transition team for rebuilding the American economy. And they're based around reinvestment in education around biotechnology, pilot plants and scale up facilities, um, and, uh, and, and particularly a bio preferred program, one that mandates mm -hmm. state and federal governments that if they can buy a bio based polymer or material, nylon is a great example, then they should be buying those for recarpeting their schools or the VA. They should be buying polymers that are made from, from uh, recycled uh, bio-based materials for their wood and their, and their desks. So I think there's a lot that could happen on the policy level that would elevate bio-based products um, at the expense of petrol-based chemicals. And I just want to add, Peter, because not a lot of people understand the, the fundamentals of the carbon cycle, that when I extract as you said, oil or coal from the ground, that's carbon that's been locked up for, for billions of years in the, in the, uh, in the, in the soil. Um, that is now burned and that's CO2 that's going into the air and causing the earth to heat up. When I take it from a bio-based source, that is a plant, for example, or a microbe that is literally sucking CO2 out of the air and it's using an energy source like sunlight and it's fixing it back into a product like a biomaterial, like a food, like a pharmaceutical, and then and then it's coming back into 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 uh, into production. Then when when that's when that's done with, it can go back into the air. So it's a complete. It's not, it's not toxic. You can actually just completely recycle it. I remember experiments we were doing at the Autodesk lab uh, out at Pier Nine, where they were using gr ground up shrimp shells, which have chitosan. And it was being turned into a, a photopolymer that you could 3D print. And then when you were done, you just crumbled it up and put it in your garden. And it was actually like super rich in nitrogen. And so it took a waste product and, and, and it's not toxic. And actually every 3D printer in the world that has photopolymers causes mutation, mutations in the DNA of fish. So probably we don't want our kids doing that. But having something that actually came from the ocean and, and is totally carbon based in a different carbon economy, not the carbon petroleum economy, but life, carbon, carbon economy, bioeconomy is a significant thing that that means we're using kind of the dictionary, the glossary, the encyclopedia that nature already figured out. Like we exactly. don't have to we can ask nature before and these, we try to do something. And these yeah. are yeah, yeah these ahead. are these are, these are the green collar jobs that can come to Dayton, Ohio. They can come to Pittsburgh and they're gonna stay there. These aren't the tech jobs that, that, are, that are just effervescent. They can appear and then disappear. They could go to India. They could go to China. No, these are building. These are manufacturing. And they're sucking CO2 out of the air and putting it into products. Mm -hmm. One of our audience has a question about its regional implications. I'd love to hear from Team Midwest, either uh, Mayor Whaley or from Pittsburgh, on how these ideas that John's put on the table uh, could apply, because this looks like that much more manufacturing opportunity and vision. 
Yeah, I mean, it's very exciting to hear John talk, right, especially about this bio bell idea. You know, uh, for example, in Ohio, uh, and I know that the study has been done, there's been folks been doing Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin around what we call large, uh, small manufacturing counties. And there are counties you would think that are more agricultural based than manufacturing based, but they have more than 11 percent of their GDP that's manufacturing. So there's a natural fit between um, the work of, you know, how we move agricultural into this um, biology piece to make things. I think, again, that's that's I, that is our our basis for who we are. So I think that has huge opportunity in places across Ohio and and frankly, Pennsylvania, which is, you know, jokingly told Pittsburgh in the West and Philly in the East and Alabama in the middle. So there is lots of space there to do lots of work like that because we have lots of land, frankly, and we have lots of opportunity there that, but I think the difference is, is that it is, is already connected to manufacturing. So mm-hmm. and there's a natural, there's a natural fit to that. Um, I think the key message is, you know, that, and I, we've always said this in Dayton is that we make things. And I think that's still making things and making mm-hmm. value. And John's point too, mm-hmm. about, um, jobs moving in and jobs moving out. This region is a place where jobs are considered to be long term, and if they're not considered long term, they're not really considered like a good job. And so there's a real value around that longevity that's really important to this community, these communities. And one of the reasons why you know I I really believe in this idea of like universal guaranteed work rather than guaranteed income because there's so much value that comes to who someone is based on the value of what they do for a living in this region. It's our identity. Yeah. I think this is uh, missed out. I think by a lot of people who talk about universal basic income without realizing that humans won't, can't help themselves. We love making things. We love doing things. We make it our identity. What we don't do is we don't teach people how to go through that sort of hero's journey of when we are competent and confident, and then suddenly we're thrown out. Right. And, and the hero's journey that puts us in the bottom. And we don't teach people how to learn how to learn, how to actually think of this as a lifelong journey right. that that we can find through that liminality, we can find the next thing. And uh, there's, there's even work right now, uh, Byron August, uh, who was in Obama's team for economic advisory, um, he's got something called Opportunity at Work. And they've done a data set of 70 million Americans who, who make $15 an hour, but actually have all the skills to learn on the job, to have $45 an hour jobs, but there's no pathway. And he's been able to actually find millions that actually have succeeded in doing this. And he's going to you know, uh, the, the, the former chairman of LinkedIn, he's going to Microsoft and others. He's saying, remove your bachelor degree requirement. Mm-hmm. I can prove to you that if you build a path that they actually can learn on the job just like everybody who comes out of college with a bachelor's degree does. Right, right. Like in rapid time. And this is called opportunity at work. And they're looking at building a marketplace for businesses to say, let's actually lower the barrier and even the algorithmic checking for resumes for a bachelor degree. And let's actually listen to what people are capable of. Because you know their, their actual skills are hard won, but they're subtle. And, and a resume never shows what you actually do with your muscles with your mind muscles, with your, those little details you learn in manufacturing are critical. Well, and I would uh, say, I really like Peter's point about this regenerative uh, economy and regenerative idea. And you could even argue that, that we've done that with people. We've extracted people for what we need. Uh, yeah. When it doesn't work anymore, when it's over, we kick them to the curb and say, oh, I'm sorry, you're not tooled right. You know, you spent your life in a factory, no good. And we haven't even th- thought of that as a like opportunity, like you're saying, Mickey. So I really like this frame you're talking about, Peter, about this, the a, a regenerative economy, a regenerative life, regenerative, you know, um, making of things. There's just so many opportunities there that we have just been extracting and using and using and this culture of using everything to its end that really needs to be rethought and, and just reconsidered. So very, very powerful frame. Just what wanted I to flag that we have people from Nigeria, yeah. and Atlanta, actually streaming it to like 35 or 40 students right now, um, uh, listening in because this is actually something the whole planet, we have to figure this out. <laughs> and and uh, and and whether we like it or not, and I don't know that America should be the world's policeman or anything like that, or or only guide. Um, people came here because we had this chance to be to have fair opportunity, and if we can be a positive template, 
we should be, we should try, but we should also probably be a lot more humble than the last, you know, because of the last 40 years um, and, and figure out how to, how to grow. Uh, Leslie or Grant or anybody it's sort of open-ended we're after, yeah, after the yeah. top of the hour. So it's kind of overtime. <laughs> yeah, one of the things just to the, the regional policy question that, that I'd add in is that, you know, one of the things that we've seen, particularly on the, the regenerative agriculture side and, and the importance of food in our local economies is that we've seen how our supply chains are incredibly fragile. During the yeah. And the idea that you can manufacture and grow the food that you need from the place that you in the place that you live is incredibly important to a region's resilience. Um, you know, we've seen that because, you know, here in Pittsburgh, one of the things we just did as a team uh, uh, we completed a study called Feed Pittsburgh, which talks about the issues of food insecurity. Uh -huh. One in five people in our region do not know where their next meal is going to come from. Mm -hmm. And that is a place of the greatest abundance on earth. And the idea that, and effectively, that's a supply chain issue, right? Yeah. The idea that we can't connect the resources to the people that need them most. Um, so the idea that you can build an entire industry around it is really kind of critical, I think, in terms of local economies helping to solve that problem. But it's also important if, on the functional side in terms of the planning and development cycle and also procurement. You know, so we have the, the capital and the resources to make these investments, whether it's in regenerative agriculture and reduction of food waste or in the clean energy economy, we're making buying decisions every day. Um, so to leverage those dollars is really critical and then providing the platforms. That's the other thing that local governments do is provide the platforms for local businesses. Um, so, you know, for John's companies to come into communities like Dayton or Pittsburgh, we can make that possible. So actually Grant or Nan or Leslie, I would love if anyone has a question for John, just because John is living in this very different world, but actually comes from a world where he's had to deal with really hard system engineering problems long before biology. Um, any questions for sort of just that he can source and think about or give you ideas from his community? So I, I, I'll package it as a question, but I'll first uh, say something. My reaction to what John was sharing as well as with the others, um, what uh, Mayor Whaley and Grant just put on there was uh, this piece about innovation and research and development, right? So who's coming up with these great ideas? Who's testing them? Who's doing, so this piece is I think central. So when, we, when you hear Mayor Peduto and Mayor Whaley talk about the role of universities. The study grant just mentioned is another collaboration with research partners that are not based in the city government. You have to go outside to find folks who are doing this kind of work. So I, I think there's tremendous potential to be working um, in applied university community partnerships here. And those community stakeholders can be governments and municipalities. They can be, um, the universities can be agricultural extensions. They can be the flagship universities in our states. Um, because they're so connected in those communities, most universities have community engagement programs of some kind. So being able to pair them with applied research on these new technologies um, in this space. And in fact, you know, I, I know the University of Pittsburgh, we have a, a tremendous number of programs that do this kind of research already in the community. I'm sure that is true of our other universities. So use that as a segue to say, you know, John, when you're um, working with some of these new technologies, are you seeing some of these innovation come out of universities that's being tested in communities? Because that's sort of the model we'd really like uh, to capture in, in our part of the country anyway, and hopefully see spread. Yeah, it's all coming out of universities. There's no coincidence. I'm here in the Bay Area and Stanford and UC Berkeley and UCSF, and you've just got this ring of fire in terms of companies and startups in, in this industry all around here. Um, and you've got the, the pay it forward culture that when these founders succeed and they and they have a nice exit, they, they turn around and they look to back the next founder. So, yeah, I think it's all about the ecosystem and it's all about the universities and, and uh, investment in, in education and research and development. So I think you're spot on. I, I have a quick question, too, for John. Is what are the types of products you see coming to market, either in the near term or the long term? Sure. One of my favorite that I just tasted is called My Bacon, and it's mycelium-based <laughs> uh, bacon. And mycelium is this uh, is this fungus that's very versatile. It's used for everything from making uh, leather to making packing materials. Um, but now uh, it's uh, it's also used for making uh, faux meat. So the bacon is uh, one of my favorite products. And that's a company called Atlas Food in upstate New York that is one of my favorites. Um, um Mycelium, let's stop for a second, right? This is Mycorrhizal Networks. It's like the internet of plants. 
Uh, it's been around for a long time. Um, I remembered that your North Face one, when you look at the tag on the North Face jacket, it says protein derived cellulose. It actually has a nutrition facts on the jacket, kind of like on a bottle of orange juice. And, um, and then one of the other companies you featured was called Bolt Threads, which was unleather, and Microworks, which has fine mycelium blends. And to actually think that you would see fine mycelium blends, like it's actually, it's like a, a posh product. It's not, <laughs> like, you know, and, and, um, and it's already, these are coming out. These are out there. You know, unleather, what, why aren't we using unleather for the next uh, electric car? What's, you know, what's going on in manufacturing for those things? So what's another one that, that you know, to continue Grant's question? Yeah, another one of my favorites is, um, is Berkeley Brewing Science. And they are making a version of brewer's yeast that has the gene for the aromatic flavor that makes the hop plant uh, bitter. And they've sequenced the hop plant, the DNA of it, and they've taken these 3,000 letters of DNA or so, and they put it into the brewer's yeast. And now they can brew yeast and the yeast is growing and it's making the bitter IPA flavor. So you can have an IPA without adding, basically, without adding hops. And hops is pretty bad for the environment, the amount of water that it takes, um, the amount of land that it takes up. And, and, and brewers don't like hops because it's, very, it's the most expensive ingredient in their beer. And there's these giant fluctuations in price. They have to buy, you know, these, these supplies of hops years out to get the, uh, to get the price that they want. So they're happy to, uh, to get these new uh, kinds of yeast that can brew it without it. And then my, my next right. product is, is related to that. Um, and I'm an advisor to this company. It's called Z-Biotics. And it's an engineered probiotic that produces an enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase. And uh, does anybody know what uh, aldehyde? There's a product that's broken down into something nasty, which is aldehyde. Does anybody know what product that is? From aldehyde? Um, I'm not sure whether formaldehyde breaks down aldehyde, but alcohol breaks down into aldehyde. And it's the aldehyde that gets into your, into your blood vessels in the brain, cause, inf causes inflammation, and that's the something hangover that you get on uh, the day after Christmas Day. So this is a company that's got an engineered probiotic. You drink it when you take your first drink of the evening, and these happy bugs sit in your gut, break down the aldehyde, and you wake up guilt-free in the morning. Wow. Oh, that sounds the most amazing of all. <laughs> John, speaking of, of brewing things, in your conference, you had a session on how we could brew, not build buildings. And this same technology gets into building materials and concrete's very carbon intensive. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, that's one of my favorite visions of the future. And uh, the book you were referring to earlier, Mickey, was one of Kim Stanley Robinson's. And I've spoken with Kim Stanley Robinson when I was working at NASA. He came to, to visit me and got some mm -hmm. advice for one of his books. I often showed a picture at NASA thinking about the future of building materials on Mars. And you could take a, a, a sequoia, a giant sequoia, a redwood tree, and have a seed in the palm of your hand. And have that grow into this giant structure, you know, many, many yeah, times. Manufacturing instructions all inside of that seed, right? It's, it's okay. more deep thing. Everything is there that you need. You can imagine sending that single seed to Mars and having it grow an underground root structure, a uh, habitat uh, for, for future SpaceX settlers. And so that's what I'm really excited about is the ability then to understand the design principles of nature and the ability to understand how a tree uh, can, can grow. An oak tree, I have a giant oak tree in my yard how it can survive these giant, uh, mm. these giant winds and still stay structurally sound. Um, then there are other companies that are, that are making bio-based concrete, as, as Peter mentioned, um, and, uh, and other companies that are making bacteria that can fix cracks in concrete once they emerge, so literally living buildings. So there's a huge amount of innovation going on at the intersection of biology and the why living. Why now, John? The why, why now? Why not 10 years ago? Why not 50 years ago? Why, why bio as a manufacturing approach now? So bio is still really new. We only discovered a DNA in the 1950s. Um, the re, the, the, we only read the first sequence of DNA in the 1970s. We only wrote the first gene in the 1970s. Now we're seeing the intersection of biology and technology. And in particular, we're seeing exponentially falling costs of reading, writing, and now editing with CRISPR of DNA. So all of these things are just taking on an exponential curve. 
and a lot of new people are getting into the field and it's cheaper to do it. So it doesn't necessarily cost you millions of dollars to do a yeah, buy. Companies sometimes start with almost, I mean, a very small amount of money. Uh, uh, Seth from 50 uh, VC was telling me that if they can actually build something and show it in the lab that can actually do something crazy, like what you just said, by by gluing together these bio bricks, you know, of building components that human that that nature came up with, if they can show it, they don't have to spend three billion dollars with marketing budgets because people see it and they do it, right? It, you've proven something new, and uh, when you keep saying these things, like kind of how do you read and write? I think of the album era, which is where I grew up in music, um, and I love the albums. And then suddenly one day, you know, you could rip an album. It maybe it was a CD, but you could also do it if you had a nice MP3 converter or something into the computer, and then you could send it to a friend. And I think that's what happened in uh, the beginning of this pandemic. The COVID was ripped like a CD into the computer and suddenly crowdsourced by scientists at, at universities around the world. And Moderna had their first example in like January. And it's taken this long to get through FDA approval, but in January, like they were able to basically do a test, learn, build, test, build, learn cycle so fast because they could apply machine learning. They could apply all the network and stuff that we had. I almost feel like this is about shifting to playlists and DJ culture, right? Sort of, I want a playlist for my life that actually helps, helps my city or something that could assemble and think about this stuff. It's just a weird metaphor, but it pops into my head as I think of this. And, you know, and how do we build a playlist? Yeah, and artisanal production. I think that's a huge area. It doesn't need to be hundreds of millions of gallons in fermenters. It can be craft brewing. You can come up with something small, a small innovation in food tech, a small material, and you can innovate on this artisanal level. Um, because the large companies, they want innovation. They want to try these new materials. They want to bring these new things into their products, but they don't have an ecosystem yet. So I think mm -hmm. there's a huge opportunity for this artisanal bio manufacturing to, to take hold in, in many different cities across the bio belt. Can I ask a question of John? The one question I was going to ask is we've seen, you know, particularly in the energy sector, sector the petro, the petro companies really fight and, you know, use, use, um, use the government, use uh, legislation to really keep the innovation from going because it was not in their best interest, right? And you mentioned at the beginning of your comments, this $1 trillion industry of, of what, you're, what you're up against on this work. Are you looking at ways, as, as a leader in this industry, are you looking at ways that you can get around that or learning from how long it took the energy company, the, the um, renewable energy companies to work through that. How are you thinking about that? Because that can be such a deterrent to innovation and, and this kind of change because folks have a vested interest in it not working out. Yeah, but there've, there's been a couple of waves of innovation. And one of the earlier waves of innovation around 15 years ago was the biofuels wave. There was a billions of dollars that went into biofuels mm -hmm. and, and, and a big bust. And right. the reason for the bust is this carbon cycle that I mentioned, that it's far easier and cheaper for me as BP to suck out oil from the ground and burn it than it is for me to suck out CO2 from the environment and to try to fix it back into something else like fuel. That, mm. that clearly you're not going to be able to compete with, with those two processes. So until we have the proper... Um, the proper carbon tax and cap and trade in place, and and which is good, going well, I think, in California and is spreading. It, it's not going to be possible, on an, in an economics point of view, to compete with these large uh, infrastructure of, of of oil. But it is happening. Um, just here in the Bay Area, there's seven refineries near me, um, and a number of them have have not reopened after COVID, and they're not planning to. So I think it's mm. it's a this is good. I think COVID's hopefully a nail in the coffin. Uh, for the for the petrochemical industry, and I think that what we're seeing now is not the big commodity goods that biomanufacturing is coming in and, and replacing. It's these smaller, high value products like mm -hmm. pharmaceuticals, like flavors, like specialty chemicals and materials and ingredients. And they, these companies are succeeding and finding product market fit and revenue in these products. And then they're going to be the next mm -hmm. uh, P's and, and Chevrons, but in a sustainable um, and renewable way. We're talking about innovation at two ends. Sorry, Peter. We're talking about innovation at two ends of the innovation cycle. The work that you're doing in the Midwest is really 
now uh, solar is at the point or, or green energy is at the point that is it is at scale and it has to be the kind of cost advantage, full of jobs, kind of full economy movement. And you guys are facing kind of a make before break. How do we make this new economy before the 100,000 jobs go away? And John, you're working at the early edge of that where something new comes in and it's artisanal, kind of like solar was 30 years ago, you know, it was like special, right? But but all of these are moving along that 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 same line. So it becomes an interesting thing of when the stuff you're working, you know, but the nice thing is you're right. It can be small plants under the radar kind of stuff, uh, which is interesting. And I'm also- well, high, margin, high margin early on, so you can keep yeah. investing yeah. And, and actually do it right. Yeah, I think that's important. Which is yeah, that's a really good point. I think the other the other thing I've noticed and I've you know read is that every petrochemical company except for ExxonMobil has decided to invest in renewables in some sort. Like they know what is up, um, and Exxon has decided just to invest in um, uh, poor countries that aren't able to do this work yet. And so I think that's very telling that they they the, even they it's kind of like. Um, when uh, Philip Morris decided to, you know, invest in other things is what I've what I've noticed. You know, one of the things that I just thought about in this conversation was, you know, Grant, you're at the you're at the mayor's office, you're in the city of Pittsburgh. Cities have incredible power that I don't know that they always use. You know, um, we had uh, the mayor of West Sacramento actually, Nan introduced us um, at a at a summit, and he was brilliant. And he said, we were talking about education. He said, oh, a city could actually award credentials for the work you do well in the city. You know, if you're helping with a, with a local community farm and things like that, wait, a city could award credentials? I don't see that on LinkedIn, but I could. You know, and, and I, I think a city could say, actually every single thing we install in every piece of our property, all, all the land grant universities, all the other things, um, actually has to have an IoT device that notices when a photon is converted to an electron and makes an immutable ledger of that so that I can prove it. It's not a spreadsheet that, you know, like most cap and trade and carbon stuff, you know, the, the, the countries have the ability to have a fudge factor. We could use the fact that IoT is cheap, Internet of Things devices and sensing. We could say a photon converted electron creates creates a, a credit in, you know, either a blockchain or something like that. This is a company called ClearTrace, by the way, it exists and financial institutions are doing it for all their facilities around the world. A, a gigawatt or, two, or no, a much larger amount are already under under control, and it's using basically blockchain to create an immutable ledger, mm -hmm. but it's using the photon converted to electron as proof of work. So the mm -hmm. sun is the central bank, and I think a city could choose this. And actually, Al Gore is now working on something called Global Trace, which is about this for across this stuff. You could also say the soil is the central bank. How do I actually prove that that you made it this way? And in small farms in China. Um, artisanal farmers in small villages are putting Fitbits on chickens so they can prove that they were free range. I'm not even making this up. New book called Chain Chicken Farm. And, and, and these are real things happening because it's a high tech, low tech. They're blending technologies. But a city could just choose, you know, somehow. I, of course, I'm going to trivialize it because I don't understand how a city works. But, you know, you could say something about how you make things, how your buildings work, how you consume fuel you know, uh, Richard's uh, work at the Phipps Conservatory. You could just say more building, some percentage has to be net positive, not whatever. And that would that would force a big conversation. And yeah, I'm not naive here. I just- No, I'm, I'm, no, not at all. I mean, you know, as John's talking, I mean, one of the things I'm thinking about is, you know, governments help to, can, can help to create markets, right? Yeah. Um, whether that's at the federal level or state level or at the local level and particularly at the local level, what we have the operate the ability to do is to create an enabling operating environment. You know, and we've seen that in Pittsburgh, you know, 25 years ago, you know, you saw the, the advent of the or maybe 30, actually a little bit longer than that. The advent of the robotics industry, right, with some seeds that were sown at Carnegie Mellon University. Fast forward 35 years into the autonomous vehicle world, and you've seen Uber and Lyft and Argo AI and other companies kind of gravitate to a place like Pittsburgh. One, because of that early work done in robotics and artificial intelligence, 
but also because we were willing to make the city, uh, you know, that operating environment where they can be a proving ground for their technologies. That's the same thing that we could, you know, do for for companies like what John's talking about in terms of the the biomanufacturing or the regenerative economy. I mean, one of the things, just your point about buildings, this is a huge challenge for Pittsburgh and all cities in terms of the carbon cycle uh, with regards to the amount of emissions that are coming from our buildings. So in Pittsburgh, 80 percent of our GHG emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, come from the building sector from their consumption of power. And so we're working right now with researchers at the University of Pittsburgh about creating a 3D model of the city, not just to understand the energy use, but to understand the materials that are inside of those buildings. So when they're deconstructed or they're demolished, that we can repurpose those materials and, and create a more circular approach. This is the embodied carbon discussion that even product designers are now having. When you choose a material and put it on a product in a CAD tool, it shows you the embodied carbon of exactly. that material so that before it even gets to production, the product designer, the architect can actually say, yes, it's gonna cost more to do something better, but here's the long-term embodied right. carbon problem so that they can have a better argument with the owner, operator, et cetera. Exactly. Um, we're, we're coming around on the half hour mark. I wanna make sure people can also have a Friday. Um, so if anybody has to bail, please just raise your hand and jump out and have a great weekend. But this has been amazing, and I just really appreciate that you could all get together and talk. And uh, I'm fans of everybody, and I just I feel like I need to see this happening in the world because 2020 needs to end someday, and we need to we, we need to like well, have the story. Yeah. I so thank you. So I appreciate you and uh, uh, Mickey and Peter bringing such a, a group together that I never would have considered, and uh, it's really I've learned a ton just being on this call. So thank you for inviting me, and uh, thank you all for your amazing, uh, impressive work to say literally save the world. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Echo Mayor Whaley as well. This was incredible. It's great to hear. You know, it was you. not an accident that we wanted to put this on as kind of an end of year show and an agenda setter for next year. Mm -hmm. um, I think 2020 put the accent on the fact that for a while in America, one of the problems was people had trouble believing in what was the vision of what's next, right? We, we it, During the space age, we kind of had a sense for what was next. We even had one with Manifest Destiny. But, but in this era, when people hear their kids will grow up and they won't earn as much, or the environment's going to screw things up and, and there's going to be a climate change. <clears throat> We've gone through an era where we know the problem was bad, but the question was what was next? And you could argue that this last election cycle or the 2016 cycle was about that. It was about, you know, hunkering down and defensiveness. And then Hillary was calling people deplorables. But what's interesting about all of this is these are unified kind of visions of a next economy, right? This is this less extractive, greener, uh, greener thing. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about the fact that capitalism has to reform from Piketty's book on down, uh -huh. but this starts to give that form, right? And it's not, it's not a privation thing. It's not a capitalism or socialism thing. It is a new form of capitalism now with nature at our back rather than fighting her. So this, this is kind of, a, there's yeah. just a lot here. Well, and you know, John uh, has celebrated iGEM, which people have probably not heard. How many people have heard of the iGEM competition? Uh, Nan, Grant, Leslie, Peter. Uh, this is important because of, for dreaming for the future, it helps if our kids actually can dream. And so, John, can you give everyone a sentence on the iGEM initiative that's been going on for what, 10, 15 years? Yeah, if, if it's just like FUSH Robotics. If you're familiar with FUSH Robotics, for robotics is a giant competition. Well, yeah. that's same, but for genetic engineering. So you've got high school students mm -hmm. right, uh, coming coming out. There's about 3,000 of them meet in Boston every year at the convention center. And uh, they're doing summer projects. So, you know, 12 weeks or so, and they've got uh, product uh, and, and projects out that are working in biology. And uh, that was only something we could dream of 10 years ago. It was still very, very expensive and slow to do genetic engineering. And now you can get something done in 12 weeks. And by the way, this is a global competition. For high school and undergrads, it's been running for quite a while. They've kept a Wikipedia for every single team of students since it started. So you can almost do the science of the science of how the kids learn. And um, some of the students have actually been part of some of the unicorns you've heard about recently in biotech. So mm -hmm. they literally went on to Very team cool. up 
with people. Yeah. I, if you think of something like uh, Ginkle Bioworks, I don't know if you've heard of them in Boston. Um, Tom Knight didn't even change his career from a computer scientist until he was over 50. And he's one of those unicorns. And someone else from that company was part of the iGEM competition as a student. You know, and so, so we can do this now. Kids are building BioBricks today, every year. And, you know, uh, I'm going to take E. coli, which is in the stomach. Usually doesn't smell so good. Um, and I'm going to make it smell like mint when it's growing and cultivating and make it smell like bananas when it's done so I can go out and play Frisbee. That's a real project that was done by students, right? They walk in, they smell bananas. They're like ready to harvest. Like, like I know that can be scary and crazy, but, you know, the iGEM and John's whole community are saying we actually should have ethical and policy conversations now. And kids should actually be doing almost like, you know, junior UN about biopolicy now in a safe place, because this is actually just as leverageable and, and powerful as any of the other technologies that have totally changed our world. Hey, so related, maybe what, for a future, a future episode, we should talk about how the kids get involved. What, what's uh, the role of young people, of students, of citizens engaged in the co-creation of this green future that you're working on for the and Anyone who has to leave, we should probably at least give people a chance to, to leave. No, yeah, sorry, you. man. Appreciate you guys. See you later. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nan. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rita. Thanks, Mickey. So a, a quick question for Grant or for Leslie. Um, I, I've been interested in your – here's this vision of what's next. And there's a cultural component, as Nan pointed out. And in addition to the capital stack and the industry change, is there a role for – uh, you know, creating excitement among kids, competitions, uh, as schoolwork, so that it becomes part of what the city thinks about. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'll go first and Grant will fill in, but it's absolutely the case. In fact, we already have um, summer research programs at the university level. We already have students who are doing um, like residential energy efficiency assessments as part of uh, applied research projects that they're doing as part of their coursework. And that's at the university level. But at the um, high school level, Pittsburgh actually has a really active community of high school students who are incredibly engaged on all dimensions of sustainability, including social environment and economics. Um, so um, uh, there's a number of folks who are, who are doing work in that area. I would say the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh is an organization locally yeah. that's led a lot of um, uh, high school student engagement uh, around some of these global issues, and that includes uh, climate change and sustainability and, and politics along those lines. So I'd say that there it's an incredibly active uh, community. Pittsburgh's home to something like 15, or, I should say Southwestern Pennsylvania is home to something like 15,000 nonprofits. I mean, there is an incredibly active uh, network of grassroots organizations just in our little part of the Ohio River Valley, and they all have community engagement um, programs, many of which do engage um, youth directly. And then our universities, I, I could talk more specifically about yeah. examples, but Grant's been part of them, actually. Actually, I'd love to ask you, both of you, you know, how much has what Greg Baer at the Grable Foundation and others around remake learning, around, you know, kids and creativity? Because I remember being there when it was just like six people meeting around a coffee table. But now, you know, the Remake Learning Initiative around basically making Pittsburgh and the region the best place in the world to raise a kid and remembering Mr. Rogers neighborhood is now metastasizing and I'm seeing it in, and that's maybe not a great word, but I'm seeing it in many, it, they're having Remake Learning Days across the country now. They're actually taking the playbook from Pittsburgh and the, you know, public private partnership with the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon and Heinz and Grable how are you factoring that into the roadmap? Because I hope you are, and I, I don't, but I, if you're not, I want to say, please do. But what, what's going on in that regard? Yeah it's, it's, yeah, it's funny that you, that you bring that up because, you know, I was saying earlier how since we've released, uh, you know, the Marshall Plan, people are coming to us and saying, you know, like, how do we get involved? You know, just this week, it was on Tuesday of this week, who reached out to me, but Greg Bear. Greg, all right. We got to have him on the show, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's just one of my favorite people in the world, and uh, and and uh, I'm so excited that he reached out because I think you have to talk. Um, and how do you factor that in and make something even better? And they've made a movement, you know. I mean, it's there's stuff going on and learning. I was gonna say, in terms of factoring it in, I think in many ways, like we're learning from what they're asking for. So when you're talking about the companies that they want to work for in the future. 
I mean, yeah. they want to be part of transforming companies that are not doing as well as they could be doing as much as they're wanting to be part of creating new companies that are leading the way. Mm. Um, there's a lot of, when I talk to um, youth in our region, there's a lot of folks who want to be part of helping organizations do better. They don't necessarily want to come into an organization that's already doing everything perfectly. They want to be part yeah, of part making of that change happen. Yeah. Nice. nice. It's a moment when clearly people are seeking meaning and to bring about change. And you're, here, here's a wonderful vessel to do so constructively and in building the future. Um, and, and what I find so interesting about this is you put a, you put an audaciously big idea on the table. And that was my first question to Mayor Peduto. Like, is this thing too big? Because in a way we haven't been dealing with such big ideas recently and, and kind of, and that's created the opening. It just seems for a lot of this creativity. Um, yeah, you know, just to jump in there, I mean, I think one of the things that we don't want to happen is that this just becomes a Washington, D.C. conversation, you know, about about a, a bill or a funding package. But really that there's this opportunity of kind of a bottom up co-creation moment, you know, where, uh, you know, where somebody like John, for example, could find his way to a place like Youngstown and start a company. And next thing you know, it has you know, re regional supply chain implications, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, that is the piece where I think we've seen, we need both the opportunity to both get Washington to take notice to the region and provide the, the you know, the proper amount of investment and leverage, but also the ability from like, uh, to develop these projects from the bottom up um, that can start to find one another. Like that's, that's the thing that- I think this it's this notion of, you know, and, and if you actually study complex systems, and I'm sure most of you do, you know, and, and Peter, ever since he was in college and me for a long time, have studied Danella Meadows and, and people that look at, at, at sort of theories, how do you change a complex system? And meet in the middle is one of the most empower, powerful design patterns. It's bottom up, top down, and iterate through, through both um, empirics, you tried something, and then change your theory. And, and you have to have both. You have to have this meet in the middle approach where, where, where the larger, higher level stuff tries to learn. It's slower. It's a different pace layer of change, but it can also create safe place, which you talked about, Grant, a little earlier. But this meet in the middle is something I don't know we've talked enough about, Peter, about the show, but this is a design pattern for complex systems where it's really about this, this iteration between theory and discipline and evolving. And, and between they create platforms. Down, bottom up for each yeah. other um and yeah. when i say a big one idea, or the other and nature is not one or the other right like, and when i say a big idea that's not the equivalent of like okay it's top down from lyndon johnson or franklin roosevelt I, I think what i mean is it creates a realm of possibility so greg bear jumps in and then and then john shows up and says you're doing a green transition look at all the manufacturing stuff right yeah. and it expands our minds and our and our possibility frontier uh which is, you know, which is a very healthy, inclusive thing that we could use right now. I just want to point out a young uh, Zen McManus uh, commented, he never watches my, you know, weird quarantine things. <laughs> so he tuned in. Uh, he was raised in that region and he said, excellent conversation. So thank you very much, Grant and Leslie, for making me look good to my son. Uh, <laughs> that very rarely happens. Um, I'll look for another 20 years before it happens again. But uh, I just appreciate you being here. I, I do think, Peter, you're right, this inspiration. You know, the high school movement, by the way, came out of Ohio. The idea of having a high school, like a, like a public high school, because the farmers realized we're becoming so sufficient and efficient with modern, you know, industrial revolution technologies, we should send some of these kids away because they're going to run out of jobs on the farm. By the way, uh, when, when, uh, when we talk about inspiring stuff, I think I may have mentioned to you, I'm on the board of our International Economic Development Agency here in San Francisco, uh, Global SF. And I, I pointed out to all of them, and we're working closely with, with the governor, that if we wanted to see what a big idea for the future looked like, it would look something like yours in the sense that yeah. it would look across a region. And we have a lot of trouble with regional planning here because we've got a lot of different regions and then we've got the agricultural Central Valley. But ideas like this connect those up it, it would have to connect all of that it would likely be kind of brewed in a university supported by a foundation um inviting in all of these both our startups that are working on all this bio stuff that john talked about but then our more mature uh, uh you know industries 
And I, I kept pointing out what you were doing and saying, we ought to look at something that big because we have a COVID recovery plan, but you, this your thing goes smarter, so uh, further. So uh, I'd love to, when we have some of these col con yeah. conversations in California, invite you guys into that to both inspire us, but then also because there's so much capital and ideas and companies that can exist everywhere, not just uh, you know, not just stuff going on here. We'd we'd love to help facilitate that, and you know, the other thing behind like the Marshall Plan for Middle America, you know, part of that concept is geographic. It's mm -hmm. the physical place of, of, middle, of middle America, the middle of the country. But it's also the idea of, you know, the middle class. Mm -hmm. And we realized that, uh, and, you know, part of our conversation earlier today with some of the congressional representatives about, you know, how do we get the Great Lakes involved in this? Mm -hmm. And it, this is not a, 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 you know, an isolated country club conversation about just the Ohio Valley. This is effectively... How do we have these regional conversations that integrate with one another because it lifts the whole boat of the of the American economy up and make us all stronger? Um, you know, and so that that's the thing I think that is is also, you know, a piece that we're looking to learn and bring people into the conversation um, and not keep keep people out of it. I think that's exactly right. And just to add on to that, the we talked a lot about cities today, um, a little bit less about rural and suburban communities, but that's another key feature of when we talk about middle America, we have more small cities, more suburban and rural areas. And so having what um, Grant and Mayor Peduto like to refer to as the tent pole cities, right? Yep. That are sort of bringing everybody else underneath that umbrella. And this is a key part of being able to make that happen and build alliances and build um, bridges across communities that haven't always been um, benefiting from the same programs in the same way. So really strengthening uh, avenues to work across that urban rural divide rather than just talking about how there is an urban rural divide. Yeah. And so you you must be then imagining, uh, you know, manufacturing that goes into rural areas exactly. or power generations distributed, right? It, it, it There's exactly. a deconcentration here uh, that's a new architecture the, and and this is this is part of the vision thing, right? Because like exactly. people get up and think urban rural and big plant and the plant's going to come back, but you know it looks very different when it happens at the cellular level. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's exactly There's right. There's a lot more to talk about in 2021. Clearly, sure yeah. thanks but so much Christmas for joining us. Up, yeah, so let's, perhaps, uh, let's let's let them go. They're they're probably it's late there. Yeah, come on. it is. <laughs> It is. We'll just go all night, by the way. I don't know if I, I yeah. mentioned that these go for 20, 25 hours. Just, <laughs> you know, Actually, I, I do want to point out. Yeah. But, but Peter's inspiration for this was a 1950s radio show. Was it a radio show? NBC Monitor, a radio show that NBC created in 1956. Radio was falling apart because everybody was going to TV. You couldn't sell ads on radio. And the question is, what do you do? And Sylvester Pat Weaver, who was the head of programming, came up with this idea that rather than half hour shows, he would take the whole NBC network, start a show Friday night, end it Sunday night. It would go for 48 hours or whatever, and it would hop around the world. It would be curious conversation. In a way, it's a forerunner of NPR or the Internet. It was called the Monitor. Yeah, right. And the, the idea was the audience would be treated to the world. And it went on long enough that that. You aggregate an audience. That was our inspiration because we figured during the quarantine thing. What else um, do we have to do? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> so please leave now or sa save your soul. <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much, guys. I uh, love the fun. Be in touch. This was terrific. Bye bye. And uh, Mick, thanks. Okay, now we can uh, finish Peter, up on our time own. Is it? Are you going to tell us about next week's show? Because I'm. I want to tell you about next week's show. I want to tune in for next week's show, but I'm not going to be a host for next week's show. Um, no, no, Who are you? I think it should be next week's show be will like be unhosted and robotically. So the Here's the concept okay. it What's turns that? out next Friday, um, people thought that quarantine was so interesting they decided to throw Christmas during quarantine. So, oh. December 25th is Friday, and so what we thought we would do you know, we spent so much of this year looking at how the world has gone virtual, right? We've talked about the fact that we're in front of screens, virtual reality, this whole physical virtual interface. And so we thought we would dig into that and revisit the dawn of virtual Christmas celebrations. And there's a moment when that started, 1966, when uh, WPIX Television in New York for the first time broadcast the Yule Log. Because New Yorkers, long before we all went virtual this year, New Yorkers knew that their only option 
for Christmas fireplace was a cathode ray tube. And so WPIX broadcast the 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 log burning in Gracie Mansion. Where you warm your hands by a cathode ray tube, Peter, for those of us who've never seen one. I am, sh huh? Oh, you want to know what a cathode ray tube is? Yeah, can you warm your hands by a cathode oh, yeah, ray tube? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, not much heat come out of that. Too. Yeah. yeah, we need an infrared tube for that. But for those who don't who know, a cathode ray tube was basically the giant picture tube in TV. <laughs> okay, so what we have done is we're going to go back and we're going to pull that original Yule log that burned forever on Christmas, something that was everywhere and nowhere at once. But we're also going to curate some of the best virtual Yule logs from around the world because it's become a thing. And during the era of DVDs, you could go buy a DVD of a Yule log. Today, there's lots yeah. of internet Yule logs. Even Amazon has multiple Yule logs on Prime. So we're going to do that. Can and we then bring in historic stuff? Huh? Can we bring in historic stuff? Oh, yes. Like, say more. Yes, right. Well, you know, last time we had Rick Prellinger on the show with the magnificent Prellinger archives. And if you go through it, there's a lot of Christmas footage. And, and one of the things that we're worried about is so many of us can't spend time with our families this year. We're kind of isolated. Well, it turns out if you go back to the archives, there are plenty of Christmas trees and menorahs and family on film. Mm -hmm. And if, you, if, if you're thinking what I really want is footage, I want to see kids opening presents and making a mess for parents to clean up. Yeah. We're going to have it. So there's going to be... From the parental Huh? From the Prellinger archives? From the archives. Home movies, right? Oh, These are home nice. movies mm -hmm. throughout the 20th century. So that is going to be brought more more to come. We won't next be holding Friday. it, but it's next Friday, but we will, We it's going to be a, but that's going to be it. And I guess if we were ambitious, we'd fire up a platform like Topia and then invite everybody around the fireplace and create a virtual Christmas where we could all be. But that's extra credit. That sounds like a lot of work. Maybe yeah. for New Year's. For New Year's, there you go. Mick, you what know time what time is it, it is? <laughs> I think I'm time delayed. Yeah. So uh, it is now 5.53 uh, Pacific Quarantine. And uh, we're going to sign off until we light the Yule log on Christmas. Mm. And you can just put your laptop in the corner between your field of view, either the turkey or the presents, and then the virtual Yule log which will reminds us that we will all be together in person after all of this stuff happens after yeah. quarantine or the quarantine. Please don't travel anybody. Please don't just watch the show from your own little fireplace. Oh no, we, we get together after it's over. That's yes. why this year we get to watch it. The you'll log on TV. Everybody have a great holiday. We'll see you on the internet. Take care. <laughs>